Oh, you want to talk about the processes that initiate and drive urbanization and suburbanization, including the urban phenomena of megacities and metacities? Well, what a coincidence, because that's exactly what this video is about. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, now before we get into all the spatial effects of urbanization, let's just slow down for a second and remember what we're talking about. Urbanization, if you'll recall from the last video, refers to all the various factors that cause cities to grow and develop. And so related to that, when we talk about the urbanization rate, we mean the percentage of a country's population that lives within the the bounds of urban areas. Oh, and by the way, if you want no guys to follow along with this video and all my videos, then check that link in the description. Anyway, this is important to know since right now a little over half the world's population lives in cities. Furthermore, by 2050, the United Nations estimates that nearly 70% of the world's population will live in cities. And if you think about that for half a second, you begin to understand why that reality makes urban governments and city planners a little twitchy. Like, in general, cities already have the highest population density of any other kind of human settlement, but now go and add 1.2 billion more people to those places and the immense density of the density is going to be density. <laughs> I guess I was a poet and was unaware of it. Anyway, it's going to be important for you to remember that the fastest growing cities in the world are located in the poorest parts of the world. For example, cities like Dhaka in Bangladesh and Lagos in Nigeria are growing the fastest because of all the internal migrants streaming into those urban centers. And because these are largely impoverished regions, that reality, to put it mildly, creates all kinds of problems for local and national governments responsible for providing services to those populations. Anyway, the point is, urban areas across the world are growing rapidly and showing no sign of slowing down. And if that's true, then urban areas are going to to grow as they have been, and that has two major effects. Now, the first effect of growing urbanization is a cluster of three related effects, namely sprawl, suburbanization, and decentralization, all of which gave rise to new ways of using land. Now, before I tell you what those new land use forms are, let's get cozy with those three terms I just hurled upon. Now, sprawl refers to the geographic expansion of an urban area with little to no planning. So if a city experiences a high volume of migration in a short period of time, city planners and municipal authorities have to scramble to build infrastructure to support all those new people. And often that leads to building lots of residential housing and roads, etc., without much long-term planning. And so in that way, as urban populations grow, sprawl often accompanies it. Okay, now suburbanization refers to the resettling of urban residents to the outskirts of a city. Now, we talked about this in the last video, and I mentioned that for this to occur, transportation technology was needed to support it. And so throughout the 20th century, wealthier urban residents began leaving the city to settle in the suburbs where the land was cheaper and single-family housing was the norm. And at first, it was streetcars that got them from their homes to their jobs in the city, but later it was the automobile. So if both of those phenomena are occurring, that means that urban populations are becoming decentralized. It used to be that urban populations were packed together in a tidy central location. But thanks to the advances in transportation and communication technologies, urban populations are now spread over a much larger geographical footprint. Okay, so now you can see the trend in urban growth and its effects on the spatial arrangement of cities. And now I have the pleasure of introducing you to three new land use forms that have arisen in the wake of increasing urbanization. First is the edge city, which refers to semi-independent communities at the edges of cities with downtown areas and housing and office complexes and hotels, etc. And these are usually located among major transportation networks. So that means it's not entirely dependent on the city, but serves as a smaller node that is related to the city. Now, the edge city is a uniquely American phenomenon. And the thing to remember here is that edge cities are pretty much self-sustaining. Like, early suburbs were just for residential housing, and suburban people still worked and shopped in the city. So in the 1960s, more and more of the shopping moved into the suburbs, and then in the 80s and 90s, a lot more of the jobs moved out into the suburbs as well, thus creating the edge city. And let me just give you an example here in my hometown of Atlanta. So here is the city center, and you can see two major highways feeding in and out of it. But then there's another highway, also known as a beltway, which circles the city. And in many places along that beltway, you can find edge cities with industrial parks and corporate offices or malls, hotels, etc. And that means that the people who live in these edge cities, for the most part, don't ever need to travel to the downtown Atlanta area because these edge cities have everything that they need. Okay, the second land use for is the exurb, which is located outside the suburbs where more abundant land is available and typically inhabited by wealthier citizens who prefer to live in lower density areas that have previously been farmland. And that happens to appeal to a lot of people. I mean, think about it. You get to look out your window and see trees and listen to birds and name all the deer that frequent your backyard. I will name him Kenneth and he shall be my Kenneth. However, the exurb is still linked to the city via roads and more to the point, if people live here, they're required to have cars in order to get the day-to-day -day necessities even if they work from home. And today, 
more and more people have stopped commuting to the city and telecommuting for work from their ex-urban home because, you know, <laughs> Kenneth. And third is the Boomberg, which refers to a suburb that has experienced rapid growth, which is to say over 100,000 residents and becomes a city in and of itself. Now, these are often known as accidental cities because they gained urban status without ever intending to. However, they are made up of intentionally planned communities that have merged together as they have grown. And a good example here is Henderson, Nevada, which is America's fastest growing Boomberg. And like all other Boombergs, it's located along major transportation routes connecting it to a major city, in this case Las Vegas, so that people who can't afford to live in Vegas can still easily get to work. So all that to say, as urban areas have grown in the last century, new ways of using land to accommodate people's life, work, and play have grown along with them. And now the effect of urban growth you've all been waiting for, megacities and metacities. So in light of all that we've already talked about, it shouldn't surprise you that some cities have gotten so stinking big that we had to think up new terms to describe them. Like technically, this is a house and this is also a house. But come on, this isn't really a house, which is why we thought up the word mansion to describe it, and it's the same with cities. So megacities describe urban areas which contain a regional population of at least 10 million. And don't miss that emphasis on regional, since the megacity encompasses not only the city proper, but also the larger metropolitan area, which includes the suburbs, which are economically and culturally linked to the city. And if you wanted a clear illustration of urban growth, here it is. In 1950, there were only two megacities in the world, New York and Tokyo. Today, there are more than 30 megacities, to which I say, Dang. Additionally, most of the metropolitan areas that are becoming megacities today are located in periphery and semi-periphery countries in Asia and Africa. And why is that, says you? Well, says I, because cities in these countries offer many more public services and economic opportunities like healthcare and jobs. And what do we call those? Pull factors? That's right on the nose. But at some point along the line, some mega cities became more, you know, mega. And that led to a new designation, namely meta cities, which describe urban areas containing a regional population of at least 20 million. And among these giants, you have Tokyo, Delhi, Shanghai, and a small handful of others. And in addition to their giant honking geographical footprint, meta cities are important because they tend to have worldwide influence owing to their cultural and economic power on the world stage. And like mega cities, meta cities are also primarily, though not exclusively, located in periphery and semi-periphery. Countries. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 6 and click here to grab my video note guides, which are going to help you get all the content of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds. And hey, I'll catch you on the flip flop. I'm Larouts.